Well, 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 happy Wednesday afternoon to all of you, grade sevens, uh, on this day. Uh, I hope you all having a nice, wonderful, sunshiny day, and we've had an excellent morning. I've also hoped that for those of you who have been with us in this program for most of its eight lessons so far, that you have been experimenting and fiddling and um, testing all the little things and all the blocks that I have been teaching you over uh, the past few lessons. So let me, uh, as your facilitator, Mr. A.F. Gabriel, uh, welcome you on behalf of the Department of Education and of course, Africa Teen Geeks to this, the eighth session in this series of holiday classes on robotics and coding. Now we have been uh, doing lots and lots of work with animation over the last eight days. And I've taught you a lot of things. In fact, some really complex things <clears throat> that you are able to work with. But, but even if you haven't been able to grasp all the complexities of the things that we have done, uh, if you have been able to fool and fiddle around with some of the basic blocks and you're able to get you know, a stripe moving or changing color, you know, for your age, for your grade, it's a great, great start. And uh, if you like it and if you enjoy it, I can tell you, you are well, well, well on your way to, to really being, um, you know, uh, a programmer one day. Okay, now, yesterday, I, I, I introduced you to the idea of EPO, right? Remember everybody? EPO, this was EPO. I'm just running yesterday's slides again to remind us. Input, process, and of course, output. And I reminded you yesterday that many of our programs had processing, many of our programs had output, but one of the things we had been lacking is input. And yesterday I introduced you to this idea of input. And I said to you that the way uh, block-based programming, in our case, MS Zora Blocks works with input, is that it uses um, variables. Okay, again, to quickly uh, run through yesterday's slides, what is a variable? It is used to store information that the user enters. How can he enter it? In our case, mouse keyboard, but of course you can uh, add additional um, devices. Okay, so that was what we did yesterday. Now I'm going to terminate this slideshow. Uh, we don't need it for now. And we wanna go right to uh, Ms. Zora. Okay, you should be seeing Ms. Zora on your screen. And today's lesson is going to be, um, well, I wanted to do some work with you on variables, but whilst we're on the subject of animation, um, before I jump directly into in, uh, to variables, I wanted to add one last um, um, animation aspect that is in the looks tab of the code, of the um, blocks, and, and that's the, 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 the mauve ones, the, the ones that you can see on your screen right now. And what I want to do is just show you something which we call graphic effects. So if you're making some notes, and I reminded you last week to have your notebook with you to make some notes, that what I'm gonna show you now, just to complete the whole idea of all the animation, I, I'd actually uh, meant to show you this on Monday's lesson and, it's, and we ran out of time, and then I, I forgot to go back to it. Um, so, so I decided I'll just do that quickly because it's very easy and you know a lot of fun. And uh, that will really complete our collection of things that you can do as a grade seven in order to animate sprites, move them and fiddle around with them. So let's, let's get into this. What am I talking about when I say graphic effects? Okay, now let's begin by looking at the sprite that we have on our screen, Mr. Robot Guy. He's a nice sprite to uh, fiddle around with on effects, okay? Um, and when, when we say effects, we mean we, we can apply some preset 
um, algorithms that are in the computer, part of MSRS programming to alter the appearance of our sprite, our Mr. Roboti. Hmm. We can make him look different. Now, yes, we've already animated him in the sense that we, we, ch we, we changed his colors and things like that. What colors is part of changing his appearance, his effects. But we also went into the costumes and adjusted various parts of the sprite in order to create animation and movement. That's also changing his appearance, but that's changing his appearance through the costumes. So we were able to do it through the costumes. We we're able to do it with, by changing color effects, but the computer has just a few, not too many, just about five or six, I think, pre-programmed graphic effects, which can drastically alter the appearance of a sprite. And I thought, that we would just, I would just quickly introduce you to, uh, uh, to you those ones so that you can add them to your collection. Once again, a reminder for those who have joined us for the first time, all the videos um, are available on the YouTube channel for Teen Africa Geeks, so you can um, upload them all. So this one with the graphics will be there and you can, um, if, I, if you feel that you're forgetting as I'm speaking, you can always go there and uh, you know, download the video to your device and you'll always have this lesson. So you can always play it back. And um, yeah, you, you, you can experiment with the things. Okay, so what am I talking about when I say uh, graphics effects, right? Now, this is the effects which we've used before because with the car program that we did yesterday, I changed the color effect of uh, one of the cars. Both of them were green. So to distinguish between the two, I, I changed one's color effect. Okay, so, so that's what we did yesterday. But there are some other graphic effects that exist in the computer. And you'll see that there is a little down facing arrow next to the word color. Color is the default. The word default means that when you uh, use this block, the one that is already set that is there, the one that is preset to be there, um, is, is uh, the, the color one, right? So um, if you click on the down arrow, you'll get a list of the others. So let's click and what do we see? We see that we can change the color and you can also see that there's a little black tick next to color, just reminding you that which effect you are actually uh, using at the moment, and that of course is the color effect. Then of course there's the fisheye effect, the whirl effect, the pixelate effect, mosaic effect, brightness effect, ghost effect. What do these, I told you there's about six. So what do these do? Well, we're going to experiment with each of them one at a time and we will find out, okay? Now, we're gonna just have one block because we just want to experiment with the effects and click the flag, and you'll see that the color effect, which we have used already, uh, changes the, the, the sprite's color by a certain amount, right? Notice that when I press the stop button, the sprite returns to his original costume and his original state. So we don't have to change it before we change the next effect. Now we've only changing the effect by 25, but you can put any number. And here you've got to experiment as well. Uh, you know, make the numbers big, make the numbers small and see um, you know, what happens. That's the best way to learn what kind of effect you want. Okay, so let's go to the next effect. The fish eye effect. Hmm, what does this do? Let's click. Oh, did you see what happened? Let's return him to normal. So that was a fish eye effect of 25. Let's make a fish eye effect of 50. Remember, to change any of these numbers in the round white spaces, you can simply double click there and you can type your new number in and press the flag. Mm. It's, it's kind of like, like whopping, like there's a, like a fish eye somewhere in the uh, picture, but we don't know where exactly the fish eye is. Let's, let's go 100. Oh, look at that, even more. You can see uh, some sort of blurriness starting to occur. Yeah, I suppose they call it that because it, it, it might be what you would see if you had to look through the eye of a fish. Okay, let's stop that. Let's put that back to 25. And let's experiment with the next effect. That's the fish eye effect, the whirl effect. What does the whirl effect do? Mm. 
Well, doesn't show us too much. Let's change it to 50. Stop, let's start again. Uh huh. And uh, let's make that 100. And let's, okay, hmm. It seems to make a little whirly pattern, like it's kind of pushing the sprite down from the top, can you see? Uh, but it's seeming to do it in a kind of spiral. Now I'm gonna make, I'm going to uh, end this uh, session on uh, graphic effects by further experimenting with these things in a very exciting way, combining with some other knowledge that we have. But for now, uh, we just wanna see what each of the effects do. Right, so let's stop this program and let's set it back to 25. And let's try our next one, pixelate. I mm, wonder what that does. Yep. Did you see that? Ha ha, you know, we could see what they call the little pixels. You know, when things go off on the screen and you complain, you say, mom, the video is pixelated. I think that's what's happening here. Let's increase the pixelation and see what it does. Ooh, let's try 100. Hmm. Look at that. That's 100. Okay. Um, so that's the pixels. Let's return him back to normal. Okay, so I'm sure you can find some interesting use for that one. You know, like sometimes maybe you can, as he's walking, you can pixel him and then you can unpixel him and then he looks normal again. So that's just an added effect for him when he's when we make him walk. Okay, let's see what mosaic does. Mosaic, ah, let's try 25. And who, what has mosaic done? Any guesses? Mm. Whenever I ask a question, even if it seems like a rhetoric question, feel free to answer in the chat. Okay, let's go, um, let's go 50. Oh, I think I already pressed it. Ah, and let's try, let's stop the program and let's try 100. And like it, ooh. So Mosaic seems to just make duplicates uh, based on the number that you place there, obviously, and it keeps the, uh, the entire thing in the same grid. So it'll keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I guess that's why they call it mosaic. Let's put our number back to 25 and let's go to brightness. Well, I think brightness might not need any introduction. You see, it just seems to be making uh, the image brighter. And let's try 100, right? And that's so bright that we can't even see it. Uh, let's try the last one, the ghost effect. Let's try ghost 10. Stop. Okay. Also seems to adjust the brightness, but in a different way. Let's try 20. Getting a little brighter. Let's try 50. A little brighter. And I suppose it's just turning the turning him to 100 also makes him completely disappear. You know what's interesting about the ghost and the bright effect? Can anybody, and answer through the chat, can anybody think of an interesting use for this ghost effect other than just making the sprite brighter? Anybody? No. Want me to answer for you. Okay, well, this is a nice effect for actually hiding a sprite. You know, um, you can put his brightness up to 100, and obviously the sprite can st will still be in its um, uh, a spot, but it will um, uh, it will not be seen because it's too bright to be seen. So that might be a smart way of. Um, hiding the sprite. Okay, now let's change the effect by a small number this time. Let's stop the program so the sprite comes back. Hello, there you are. Thank you. All right, now we learned last week how to use loops. And again, for those of you who are, uh, if you've either forgotten or you knew, 
or you joined after that, please refer to the video on looping loops where we taught you how to use loops. And, uh, but then I'm gonna, I'll just quickly recap. As you can see here, um, uh, if you click on the control structures, you will find all the blocks that uh, are used to control sprites. And there are lots of them, not all of them are loops, but, but I taught you three that are loops. This one, the repeat uh, one, which is a counting loop. Then there's this one at the bottom. This one here is a repeat until loop, which is called a loop with a condition. We called it a conditional loop, if you remember. But now I just, let's just use this forever loop because we can always press the stop button uh, when we want to stop it. Let's change the effect five units at a time in a, in a, in a loop and, 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 and that carries on forever. And let's see what happens. Let's start with the fisheye and let's press play. Ooh, let's look at that. That's the fisheye. Now, oh, can you see that's, it's like a big fish eye appearing in the middle of the sprite. So it kind of pushes the sprite out until this fish eye is completely out there in the middle of the screen. And if you just keep letting it run, all you'll see is a big fish eye left on the screen. So I guess that's why they call it fish eye. But it has this effect of warping, um, you know, uh, the image. So, you know, in a, you know, interesting. I, I kind of left it for last, I guess, because these warp effects may not necessarily have so many applications, but there might be some places where you might want to use it. Um, let's just put a small, very small delay, like maybe 0 0.05, right? That is five hundredths of a second. So it'll still move pretty fast. I don't want it to move so fast like it is here. And that's the fisheye effect. Let's get a better picture of the world if we keep whirling. Um, the image. Let's go. Uh, and you can see it's kind of like making a whirl out of the sprite starting from the top. And and here we go. Look at him. He's just sort of getting all wrapped up. Yeah, I guess this looks pretty cool. You might find some interesting place in which uh, to whirl up the sprite, maybe as a screensaver, maybe as a part of a game or anything. I, I saw a comment earlier uh, that somebody had created a game. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool. And of course, yeah, look, that's your whirl effect. Obviously, I've got a forever loop, so it's going to keep going and keep going. And I suppose it'll just, just make lots more whirls and twirls. But you notice when we did, tried 25 and 100 and 50, we didn't get a, you know, we didn't clearly see the whirl effect. But what's happened now is that uh, the sprite is completely whirling up based on this effect. So that really is what the whirl effect does. Pretty neat. Yeah, I'm sure you clever kids out there will find an interesting use for the whirl effect. All right, let's try the next one. Pixelate. That's where it turns into pixels. And go. Okay. And really slowly, he's getting all pixeled up until the pixels get big and big and big. And then just they just get way too big to even bother. Right? So that's, you know, that's pixelate. Pixels, the pixels seem to move quite fast. Just for pixels, let's change it to one and see. Um, yeah, look, that's a little bit better. The effect is, is more gradual when you increase it only by a single unit at a time. So you can really pixelate him to this point and then, and then you can unpixelate it by reducing the effect. That, that'll be pretty cool. Okay, um, right, so that's, that's good. Um, and that's pixelate. And next is mosaic. Well, we can all see what mosaic is going to do. It's going to keep multiplying it too. And keep, he's just doubling up now. He's just making more, making more. And he's just getting very small, but he's being kept in the same space. So I think that's where they got the name from. Can you see it looks, when you really can't make out what the sprite is, when he gets so small, the whole thing just looks like a pattern. It just looks like a mosaic pattern, hence the name mosaic and of course uh, if we go to brightness here he is back again and press plays and very gradually one unit at a time we brighten him up and he goes into complete whiteness where he's completely invisible let's compare that to ghost which is pretty similar but it is slightly different can you see that ghost the entire image 
disappears altogether. Uh, but with the brightness effect, certain parts of the sprite seem to disappear first. Black goes last because black is a very dark color. So as it's getting brighter, uh, the black would need more of the adjusted effect to become bright. But ghost is a hell of a lot more uh, uniform in the way it, it disappears. So can you see, this is a fade, really. Can you see, you can actually very gradually get a sprite to fade away from where he is just by putting this loop in there. Um, and of course, those are, uh, those are our graphics effects. And I'm sure uh, you find those um, very interesting and, and useful. So um, 20 minutes into the class, and I've taught you some really cool effects. You all excited? Nice. Uh, any questions, anybody? Um, um, I'm not gonna uh, verbally, allow you to ask them, but maybe through the chat, if there's anything I can answer before I move on to the next thing. Right, no questions. All right, so you like those effects? Hmm? Um, Anybody think they uh, would use them? Yeah, I thought you might. All right, um, I actually, because I had forgotten about them, I didn't write any. I have been for you, for your benefit, been fiddling with a little bit of code. And in fact, I I've been writing up a game based on some of the things that I taught you, which I'm going to show you when you're ready. I don't want to show it to you too early. Some of the code might look a bit scary, but um, when I get some time, I'll also find some other uh, programs that I could write that make interesting use of these graphic effects. So I can just, you know, um, give you some idea of where they can be quite useful. Right, so, uh, right, that's the end of effects for today. And, and that's about all we will cover in animation. Not that that's the end of it, but anything more will, will go into a, a lot more complexity than would be appropriate for your age group, okay? So, um, Let's let's move on to what we were talking about in the slides right now. Variables, variables, and how an input and how do we um, make use of input? Now, let's take out the sprite. Uh, I you know, I'm not going to use the sprite because uh, he takes up a lot of the screen, as you can see. So I'm going to delete that sprite again. Um, you. Click on the trash bin to delete. Now I've got no sprites on my stage. And I'm going to click on the mouse face to open up all the sprites. And my machine is a bit slowish today. And uh, yeah, let's see if we can find some sprite that we could use just to demonstrate. Um, okay, I don't know. Let's use D. He's doing some thinking or. Devin or Danny. Oh, no, that's a changing. That person is changing completely. Okay, yeah, let's uh, let's use let's use D as our sprite. Okay, and let's put D in the middle of the screen. Okay, now uh, let's write some script for D. You can see now that the only sprite available here is D. There she is and events when the flag is clicked. Right, now, you have seen this before, but again, for the benefit of those who've joined, um, let's show you how we can make D talk. Um, if you go to the looks tab, you will see that there's lots of things, again, to create the idea of artificial intelligence. Ask, do sprites really think? No, but it's got you think, hmm, for two seconds, right? Um, what does that do? Well, well, we'll put it in there and we'll see. And here you can make your sprite uh, seem to speak. Will the sprite speak in words? No, not as we set up now, but you can add special um, additional devices and equipment to your computer, uh, which can activate the audio and use the sprite's words to be trans, uh, you know, uh, converted into audio, which can play through your speaker. And you can make it seem that your sprite is actually talking. But that's obviously not done through MS Roblox. You will need a special piece of software uh, to do that. So how exactly does uh, the sprite talk? 
on the screen. This is saying, say hello for two seconds. Let's just play that and see what happened, right? Did you see that? Okay, what happened? Two seconds too short for you? Okay. Um, so um, what happens is when you, when you put the say instruction, the sprite speaks in a bubble. This is known as a bubble. You are familiar with that from the comic strips. That's known as a comic strip bubble. And that's more or less how uh, you know, the sprites speak. If you add something else, second word, and let's say, hello, how, or hello, what is, okay, no, no, sorry. How are you? And if we run this code, Hello, how are you? Two separate speech bubbles because we have two separate instructions. Note, okay, what if we take that out and we put a think? What is the difference between the think and the say? Let's, anybody wanna guess before I press play? Haha, -ha, that's a good one. Answer to the chat, anybody? Anybody wanna guess what they think the difference would be between the say speech bubble and the think bubble? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it and somebody answer. Different speech bubble. More specific? Okay, you're correct. You've seen this also in comics or hello. And uh, did you see that? Okay, hello. And hmm, well, Kind of a very subtle difference. Let's put that on for maybe a little bit more time. All right, so can you see, hello is a normal speech bubble. The think bubble has those little bubble dots at the bottom. It's kind of like a, like a cloudy um, thing, which, which has little circles, which indicate that a character is not speaking and thinking. So it's, it's very interesting with comic books, um, we, we have to distinguish when you're reading them, you have to know the difference between when the character is talking out loud and when maybe he's having a thought, <laughs> you see? So those bubbles look different. Um, and, and of course, uh, that we can use that as well in, in, in our programming. So we are not going to use the thought bubble. Let's use the say hello bubble. Okay, now uh, that is how a sprite can communicate with you, the user. Now comes the big question. How do we answer? Mm. And if we do, if we are able to answer, if I can answer the sprite, well then, well then I'm giving input. That's what input means. It's when I can interact with the program that is running. Okay. All right. So. Um, let us uh, let us do that. Let's look into what we are uh, talking about when it comes to the stuff. Right, some people already, like Clara's already onto it. Um, if you want the sprite to ask a question that requires a response from the user, you do not use the say. These bubbles are just speech bubbles for, you know, maybe um, showing or indicating speech if your sprite needs to speak. Like for those cars, maybe if you don't have, it doesn't have to be words, you can put the word vroom there as they're racing. So you'll keep seeing the word vroom, vroom, vroom. And if you combine that with the sound effect of a car engine, you might get an interesting effect as your cars are racing across the screen. But there's no response required from a say uh, block. All it does is it displays speech bubbles for whichever sprite that you put the block on, all right? Okay, so if you look on the sensing um, set of blocks, you will find that there's a block here called ask. I, I was doing this just at the end of yesterday and I didn't wanna go any further because we had run out of time and I had left it to be in for today. All right, now the ask block and let's pop it into our screen so we can see what it is. It says there, what's your name? But it's you can uh, change that to any text you want by clicking it. Let's leave it in what's your name for now. And uh, we'll attach it to the sprite. So the sprite will say, hello. And then it will ask, what's your name? And then it says, and wait. Now you see the difference? 
between the say and the ask, what's your name? Now I want you to see the difference. I ran the program. Now look carefully at the at the at the stage area. What will you see different from the say and the ask uh, blocks? Hmm? Okay. Um, I was just reading uh, Bongo Mula. Okay, somebody's post that says I, I can't hear. Um, you've got some rain where you are. Okay, I, I will try to be a little bit louder, but I don't want to be uh, <laughs> too loud for some other people. I am at the correct volume that I should be for teaching at the moment. All right, okay, so let's note some differences that are happening, right? In the say hello, all you see is the bubble. But in the ask block, you see the bubble. Yes, the question mark. The question mark is there because um, it, it's in here. Now, if I take it out from there, then there won't even be a question mark there. But one thing different happens is that there's a little block that opens up at the bottom of the screen, as you can see. And when I put my mouse onto it, it highlights and it actually allows me to click in there. Now I'm gonna put the mouse in there and I'm going to click. See, first you've got to get over that space, then left click on the mouse and you will see a cursor flashing. I can move the mouse pointer away now. The whole thing is highlighted in blue. There is a tick on the, on the right end of it and there's a flashing cursor at uh, on the extreme left of this bubble. I mean, yeah, this response text. And what's it expecting you to do there is it's expecting you to respond. That's what the wait is for. Now you can see because of the wait, and I'm gonna put my pointer, can you see this wait? The program will actually go no further now. Even if you've got other code after this, the program goes no further until you type something. What is my name? I'm going to type my name, Gabriel. Okay, and how do you um, let the computer receive your input is you press this tick, okay? And now the sprite has received your answer. It, it's happy and it continues um, with the rest of the code. Of course, there's nothing there. Uh, so um, it doesn't do anything, but let's add something so we can, so we can say, uh, let's just say, um, thank you. Okay. Now, um, let's run it now. So it says, hello. And then it says, what's your name? And you can see that the because your wait instruction is in your blue sensing block, which means if you sit there for five minutes and not type in anything, the computer program will now just sit there for five minutes and also do nothing and it will go no further. So input requires the user to do something, type on the keyboard or press the mouse or do something and the program doesn't go any further and the input is received. So uh, we are now able to communicate with the user and ask the user a question. Okay to type in my name this time. And now let's click on the tick. And now he continues with the rest of the program and he says, thank you. So he asked me, he said, hello, ask me my name. When I gave him my name, he says, thank you. D is so polite. What a polite sprite you are. Thank you. Okay, so um, yes, now that's uh, how you ask a question. But now, mm -hmm, the big thing is, where did the answer go? I typed in my name. Where is my name? Do you, do you want to know? In reality, it is nowhere. It is absolutely nowhere. It, it was just typed on the screen at that moment. And if you look at this program as it is, um, our name, is, 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 isn't anywhere. And that brings me to my next thing. So I, I introduced you to the idea of input. I even showed you how you can give input. But the big thing is, is that we want to save the input. We want my name 
to get stored, okay? And that's where this thing called a variable comes into play. We generally store things um, in variables, okay? So let's do that and let's actually store my name in a variable. Um, let's go there. And let's look at this variable uh, block that says, oh, it's doing something here. All right, there's our variables, okay? This is the variable block. What can we do with a variable? We can set them, which means we can give them values. We can change them. We can show them so that the user can even see what they are. And, and we can hide them, okay? Now, uh, Yesterday, I went through the slides that show you how to create a variable. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to go back to the slides. You can play back the video recording of yesterday's lesson if you want to uh, go through the process yourself. But you, I'm going to do it now in uh, MS Dora, and then you can see uh, how, it, how it goes. And I'm sure you could follow and pick it up from there. All right. So the process, if you want to make a variable, you'll see that under the variable section in the code blocks, you will find a button called make a variable, right? There is one variable there. It's like a default called my variable. And, and, and if, if you, you can use this one. If you, if you need only one variable, you can use this one. Uh, it's a default name and so on. Generally, programmers are not too happy with using the default and so on. Uh, so we'll, let's just make our own one. So we click there, and if you look, if you remember on the slide projection, it says it opens a dialog box. What is a dialog box? A dialog box is a Windows feature, which which will, which actually brings up a window in your on your computer, and a dialog box. The word dialog means to communicate. The box is talking to you, and you can talk back to the box. How how do you do that? Well, it's asking you for the variable name. And so I'm going to call the variable name because it's going to store my name, right? So we just call it name. Um, and then we have to, the next thing on the slide, remember, you make a decision. There's only one sprite, so it doesn't matter for now. We'll come back to this when we have more than one sprite. And we'll talk about how variables can work for two sprites or three sprites or for all the sprites. Or maybe you just want to make it work for one particular sprite. Okay. And then when you're done, you communicate with the dialog box by either clicking on OK, which means it will make your variable, or you can cancel if you if you maybe click the variable button by accident and you didn't really want to make a variable. So if this box and this screen was a mistake, you can simply cancel there. But it wasn't a mistake. We, we did want to make a variable called name. So we click on OK. Right, and voila, look what happened. A new thing happened there that was not there before and has never been there before because this is now peculiar to your particular project. Okay, now a few things to note before we use this variable. Right? We created it, we named it, we called it name. I'm sorry if that's a little bit ambiguous. It's called the name of this variable is name because it's gonna store you know, my name when I, uh, when I reply, well, when I answer the sprite's question, let's put it that way, okay? And there is a little blue tick next to it. I'll tell you what that is about now. And so now you have a, a, a variable that you can store uh, the, the answer into, right? Now, the question is, how do we do that? Whenever we want to store something into a variable, we use the set block, right? So set block stores values to a variable. So can you see it says set the variable to whatever. Okay, so set the variable. Now, this is the default variable. When you click on the down arrow, you will see a list of variables. And we I'm looking for this one because that's the one I made. So I click there and it says set name to. Now it's saying set name to zero. Okay, and um, on the screen, you can see that the name, the variable actually displays on the screen and it shows you what its value is, okay? So I said set name to zero. Let's run the program. Hello, what's your name? I type my name. 
and I click the tick. The sprite says, thank you. And all the while, name is still zero. Why is my name not showing as Gabriel? Because my set instruction has set it to zero. So can you see, you can set the variable to anything that you want. And um, for example, 34, and it's, it's using numbers here. Okay. And what is your name? And let's just type some junk now and click yes. And then can you see what happened there now? It didn't make my name Gabriel or whatever. I didn't, I typed some junk there, but whatever I typed didn't seem to matter. It didn't change my that variable to 34. It's storing 34 because the instruction is set. So first I want to tell you that you can set a variable to anything that you want. Okay, now, interesting. 34 is a number and my name as a set of letters or characters or words, right? How do we distinguish between these two? In most programming languages, you have to distinguish, right? Later when you learn Python or whatever else you might learn when you get to high school, um, you have to tell the computer exactly what you're wanting to store. You store names and letters in different places that we store numbers. Numbers are also broken down into a wide range of categories. There are decimal numbers, then there are scientific numbers with exponents like times 10 to the 100 and things like that. And all of those have an implication with regards to how big they are. Some numbers are so big that they require a lot of space. Remember, these, uh, these numbers are stored now on the computer. Can you see? This number 34 is now stored um, on the server that of, of whoever is running um, uh, this uh, MS Zora block program for us. And that's gonna take space. So what if I had big, huge numbers? Um, you know, they might not have space to store such a large number. So in real um, programming languages that we learn later, you will have to know the types. But the good thing is because this is a learning language, um, you don't have to worry about that. You see what happens is the computer figures out what it is you are storing based on what you type. So if you type only letters, the com uh, then the computer will think you, did, you want to store words. But if you type only numbers, then the computer will assume that what you're trying to store is a number and it will save it as a number. If you mix them up, and numbers and letters, um, that's also just stored as characters, not numbers. Now, what's the difference? Numbers, you can do mathematical calculations on them. See this number 34? If I say times two, the computer can multiply and it can give me 68. You all knew 34 times two is 68, right? But um, you can't multiply a, a, a person's name. If Gabriel was there and I said, what is Gabriel times two? Well, then, you know, the computer does not know how to multiply words and letters by two. That actually doesn't make sense. Mathematical multiplication doesn't make sense on letters. So, you know, the difference is important, um, and, but you don't have to worry about it. If you become a programmer later on, you can pick up how to distinguish between them. But good news for all of you today, uh, Ms. Zora will figure that out for you. You don't have to worry. It will store the variable in the correct uh, location. You simply have to just answer the question. And that brings us to the key. How do we get our name, what we typed in that space to get stored into the computer? All right, let's go back to sensing. Okay, you'll see that there are two things that are combined together with the ask, and that is the answer. See, the answer, the ask and the answer, these two blocks, they work together. Whenever the sprite asks a question or whenever you use the ask block, we use the answer together with it to actually capture the answer from the user. So now the answer goes, is, is, is going to be captured from that space that the user Typed in. So we, we're not going to set the name to 34. Um, you are going to, 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 to put it as, um, you're going to put it as answer, right? Now let's read these blocks quickly. What is your name? Wait, when you type the name, it will then set the name, which is your variable called name to whatever answer you typed in the block, 
Okay. And let's, uh, let's do that. Let's go with that one. Run the program. Hello. What is your name? I type my name. Oops, put in K there. Click the space. It says, thank you. And now, can you see the variable called name is now um, storing, it's now storing my name. Okay, see that? Okay. Um, the sprite can use it instead of saying, uh, well, we can say, thank you. Um, we can add a say block that says, say, and then you can put your variable there. Okay. Now that you had stored the answer into your variable called name, now your variable called name has uh, your name stored in it. Anybody, any sprite, or any part of your program, whenever you use this oval shaped variable called name, well, your name would uh, get used. That's obviously coming to the end there, so you, you actually won't see it. So let's put a little delay there and let's see what the program looks like now when we run it. Hello, what's your name? Let's change it to Adam. Go into something different. And the sprite says, thank you, Adam, right? So now you have this appearance that the sprite is talking to you. You entered your name and now it's responding using your same name, right? So when people see this happen, we create again that special word, the illusion of artificial intelligence. It appears as if the sprite kind of knows, uh, you know, what you are, um, um, you know, as if it's like learned your name now. But again, if you look at it, this is an algorithm and the sprite is merely following your instructions, right? Okay, so that is how we, um, that is more or less how we um, uh, capture information. And, and of course, it doesn't have to be names. You can put numbers there. Let's run it and put a number. Um, and, and now the computer will capture this number. Let's put 67, right? And click there and it says, thank you. And then it says, thank you, 67, right? So can you see the sprite doesn't realize that doesn't make sense for somebody's name to be 67. Although we, we do have a 50 cent in the world, but I don't think we have a 67. So the sprite doesn't care whether it means anything. It simply follows your uh, instruction. And, and, and that's more or less, um how we we use a variable okay um now uh are there any questions okay uh okay i'm reading the chat somebody is saying too fast where did you find set name okay there's no set name we look at the instructions in the code there is ask what's your name and I'll go back to the sensing for you. And you'll see that there's an ask, which you'll take there. And there's an answer block, which is separate. Can you see if I remove it from there? I had 34 in the background. It's not using that. Now, this is a separate component in the sensing block, which you can use to capture an answer to the question, right? But this is the important block. I'm spending a little bit of time on this because it's important, right? This is how a variable works. You create the variable first. We did that. Here it is, it's name. Whenever you use this variable called name, you drag this oval shape into your program. You can use many copies of it as you want. Can you see? You can use it multiple times. You can put it in different places, right? Okay, I don't want all these now. Okay, and so the name um, is our, the name of our variable. So we are setting this variable's name to the answer that the user typed in this block. So ask and answer. Can you see those two blocks are blue? That's why it's helping you to show you that the ask and the answer block work together. And we have used a variable today to store that answer, right? There's no, you, you see, can you see the answer is oval? It's not, it's not um, 
It's not a, it's not a block. So remember these oval shaped things cannot connect to anything. They can't just, uh, they're not blocks of instructions. They're not, it, answer is not an instruction. It's actually just a, in, uh, a command to tell the computer to store the answer that the user types, you see? So it doesn't work on its own. Answer works together with this ask block, right? And then you, 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 you store the answer that you get. Uh, and, and that's everything there together, right? So again, have a look at it. And um, yeah, uh, that's more or less how we, we, we capture input. Um, one last thing, um, you will find that the variable appears there. Now that's nice because we can keep track of it. You see, we, we can see what this variable is doing. And and we can we can keep track of it because we can we, we know what it what its value is because on the stage it appears. It can be very annoying though because the, if we make more variables, you'll find that they'll all just appear there in a list. Right. So you can if you don't like this here, uh, besides the fact that you can move it around and put it anywhere on the screen you like, if you don't like it there, uh, you can always remove it. Can you see this? Um, blue this well it's the white tick in a blue background i said I'll, I'll get back to that this blue tick here is showing you that you want this variable to be seen on the stage if i take this tick out you will now find that although the program will work as normal let's run it hello what is your name my name is bing bong with some exclamations and it says, thank you, bing bong. Okay, so the sprite is still able to uh, use the variable because my instructions are saying use it, but we're now just not seeing it on the screen. It's not there anymore. So it kind of, you, you know, usually what we do is we put that there when we're testing just to make sure the variable is working. When we're happy that the variable is working out, we take it out because we don't want the user to see all our variables that are working, right? If I click on the tick, you'll see that it'll put it back off, on, off, on. So Bing Bong's there, Bing Bong's gone. Now you see the name is stored as Bing Bong. Even though the program has stopped running, the variable now still holds that name. That is now in the computer's memory and it will stay there as Bing Bong until you close uh, uh, your interface, close this web page, and go out of it, or if you close up the program. Okay, it doesn't disappear. The other way it can change is if, um, you you ask what ask for another name, and and then you type in a second name, and then uh, it loses the first one. So you can't uh, keep more than one name. A variable can only store one single thing. So um, if we had to do, for example, another ask and another answer. Mm, okay, let's do it here. When we go to sensing and we use ask, we generally drag them both out at the same time because we know we need to use both of them, right? And then we go to the variable. So we ask again, what's your name? Um, and then we say, oh, let's change it to uh, what? Um, let's change it to how old are you? And then we'll set this. Okay, no, that doesn't make sense now. Then let's just say, what is your other? Or let's say, what is your nickname? And that's more makes more. Oh, what did I write there? What is your O oh, nickname? Right, what is your nickname? Okay, and I'm gonna use the same variable called name to store my nickname. And I'm going to tell the computer to use the answer that the, the user types on the instruction page to store it into the variable name, right? Now watch what happens uh, to the name. Also, let's just add a, say, um, and the name. Let's put that variable there again. Okay, so it'll also, so you'll see a nickname. Now let's run it. Hello, what is your name? My name is Gabriel. 
and then it's going to follow the next instructions. Thank you, Gabriel. And it's going to wait three seconds. Then it's going to say, what is your nickname? Right now, I want you to watch closely. Can you see the name Gabriel that's stored in the variable called name? Because I stored it there. Now it's asking me what's my nickname. My nickname is Gabes. And then I click, when I click the tick, I want you to watch the space here. Watch the variable and what happens. Right, can you see? The sprite says, repeat the name because it's written there using the variable. The variable has now changed to Gabes. The previous name that I typed, Gabriel, my full name is now lost. It doesn't keep the old one. The new one, and this is the computer word, computer speak, overwrite. The new one overwrites the old one, right? So a variable, and to close off this lesson now, can only store a single thing, can only store one thing, one number, one word, one combination of characters from the keyboard. Uh, you can put anything in there. Remember, we are capturing input from the keyboard now. So you can put even, uh, even these symbols, that's all fine. All of those can be used. Can you see? It stores that. It's even going to spit that out. Thank you. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Uh, now it wants my surname and mixture of numbers and letters, and it can store that. So you can pretty much put anything from the keyboard, but the main indication in this lesson is that uh, the input is coming from the keyboard. Remember, we said we're using lots of input devices. We can use the mouse. We can use the keyboard and we can buy some special things, but the keyboard has, it will be used mostly because it has all the alphabets and the letters and that's generally where we wanna put in numbers. You know, numbers and letters are most commonly the kinds of inputs that humans would want to put into uh, the computer. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our lesson. Well, let's just, it's not about where, there's so much with variables, so we can't call this lesson the be all and end all of variables. We will call it, just an introduction to the variable, okay? Um, again, once again, looking at this code and downloading the video so you can have it in front of you, you can you know, write your own code and fiddle around with things. But at the same time, um, perhaps um, I will um, write a lot more code using variables in our next class. And that will happen uh, tomorrow. Same time, same place. We've got two minutes left. Uh, through the chat group, is there anything you might want to ask? I might be able to answer it, or I might have to defer it to tomorrow if it's a long thing. Okay. Right. Uh, can you teach us how to make a game? No, uh, I'm going to demonstrate a game with you. Uh, but really speaking, uh, you need to do that. You need to combine everything that I taught you uh, to be able to create a game. I will give you a kickstart. I will, I, will I, will, I will write up a very simple kind of game idea for you, and then you guys can build upon it. Um, yes, yes. Um, the ping pong game is, a, is, is, is also something that I've been writing up to show you. Um, so, so, but we'll look at more of that when we are ready to get to that space, right? Uh, the ping pong game will use some variables in a very effective way. So we will have to be able to, uh, you know, get some experience with using variables, right? Um, I want to just remind everybody, uh, it seems that in this group, we have lots of different people um, with different skill sets. Some people said they've done this before, but then I've got other people that have never done this before. And I want to remind all of you here, that uh, the target audience for this particular holiday program is for those people who might never have seen programming before. And, and so we want to give you an opportunity to experience it and maybe make a decision about whether this might be for you and maybe you wanna do the subject when it comes into school. And with that, guys, I wanna to say to you, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I hope you, I, in fact, no, I, I know you learned some very interesting things today. And I'm looking forward to teaching you a lot more about actually making effective use of variables we're going to do that tomorrow, one o'clock, same time, same place, right here in your house. Goodbye, everybody, and see you guys tomorrow.